I am so jealous that my guest got the shots that I wanted to get just a few years ago. My guest this episode is Ben Masters of Finn and Fur Films. Ben has just released his new film, Deep in the Heart, which is narrated by Matthew McConaughey. And well, all I can say is that I am deeply jealous because he did get the shots that I could only dream about getting just a few years ago when we filmed the same species, or one of the same species that he focuses on in the film. And, you know, back then we didn't have the budgets or the technology and, um, well, we just, we just didn't get them. So, uh, but Ben did and they're magnificent. This podcast is proudly powered by Battleborn Batteries. Let the power of lithium take you on your journeys across the outdoor world. Battleborn Batteries is the industry's top choice for lithium-ion batteries. Reliable, safe, and long-lasting, Battleborn makes the sustainable and lightweight drop-in replacement for traditional lead-acid batteries. Are you ready to make the switch to lithium and switch to green energy? If so, all batteries are in stock now, and you can shop today at BattlebornBatteries.com. Hey Ben, how's it going? Great to see you this morning. Uh, great to be here. I've been listening to your podcast for a long time, so this is a real honor uh, to get to talk to you about our movie. Well, fantastic. Well, I appreciate you being here and taking the time out. Uh, I've seen a lot of your films, and so it's an honor to have you here as well. And um, I'm glad that you listen to the podcast. Always nice to meet people who get to come on here and who actually listen to it. That's fantastic. So I'm going to start this the way I start all of these, and that is to find out a little bit about your background, uh, what it was that led you into the wildlife filmmaking industry. So how did it all start for you? So I studied wildlife biology at Texas A&M University, and I was going to go into either land management or research, but uh, some different events in my life led me to do this uh, trip across public lands in the American West on some wild horses that we adopted and trained, and we made a video out of that called Unbranded. That was in 2013, and... It had a message about um, public lands, about you know wild horse adoptions. It was also a character profile on myself and these three other individuals that did that trip. And the film was directed by a fellow by the name of Phil Baraboo that was based in Bozeman, Montana. And I was I was a character in that. I was one of the extremely fortunate people that got to ride horses from Mexico to Canada. And Whenever that movie came out, I got to see the impact that movies can have on people and how it can um, inspire, how it can, you know, educate, how it can get people to see nuance in a topic. And um, through that movie, we were able to get hundreds of these wild horses adopted. We were able to, you know, go to D.C. and show it to the Bureau of Land Management and the Secretary of the Interior watched it. And it it had a, an impact, like a very tangible impact. So after that experience, I started making films myself. Uh, I started directing some short films here in my home state of Texas, uh, starting about seven years ago. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, wildlife, adventure, conservation. Uh, I've got a small film company called Fin and Fur Films and we do about six or so short films a year after Unbranded we've done two feature links uh, since then we did a movie called The River and the Wall that released in 2019 which was about the uh, how a border wall would actually work in Texas and if it would work in, in achieving its uh, stated goal and also its extreme impacts to wildlife private property rights uh to access to the river and just kind of portrayed the u.s mexico border in a in a way that wasn't fitting the narrative at the time um that movie did well and then i started 
a film called Deep in the Heart three years ago, which is uh, the first blue chip film that I've ever made, and it's about uh, my home state of Texas. And I have to say, I just saw uh, Deep in the Heart last night, and it's a phenomenal film, and we'll get to that because that's your latest, your latest production. Um, and I got a lot of questions about that. So I hope you've got about three or four hours because um, <laughs> I got lots of questions for you. <laughs> um, so, so let's let's go back a little bit. I mean, you, so when you were in Unbranded, what was your role in that at the time? You were on screen. You were riding. Were you were you connected with the film in other ways? I was, yeah, I was very connected with it. I mean, you know how it is with documentaries, many roles wear many hats. So I ended up with the producer credit. That trip or that film, um, I was, I guess you could call like the the mastermind that got the snowball rolling down the hill. And uh, I was smart enough to stay out of the creative process because I had no idea what I was doing at that point in time. But I helped a lot with the fundraising. I helped a lot with the distribution and just kind of, got the whole thing going but i credit the reason why that movie is good to you know the cinematography team the director phil uh the editor they they really made that movie so much better than i could have possibly imagined um but yeah it started with kickstarter so my film career started um with with kickstarter asking people to help you know pitch in what they could to honestly make this dream that i had of 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 making a movie come true and um, every time somebody sends me a Kickstarter, I'm like, heck yeah, man, here's 50 bucks. Like, <laughs> go get it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such an incredible tool for independent filmmakers to be able to fund their own projects like that. Did you have a big group of people that you could kind of get out to? Because that's one of the things with uh, crowdsourcing is it's always like, how many people do you know? How many email addresses do you have? Who can you send it to? Do you have a massive following on social media? Did, did you have any of those things to start off with? No, I, I really didn't have a lot of, of help looking back on it. I mean, I had a Facebook account with a couple hundred people on it. And then, you know, the other people involved had, uh, you know, probably the same. But I didn't, I mean, like, today I have a social media following. But back then I did not. Primarily, most of those contributions came from people that we actually knew. Uh, but also, we put together a pretty good, you know, good seven minute Kickstarter video that had high production value that got people super excited about it. And whenever we released it, it just took off and got into these different circles of, you know, um, horse trainers, backcountry horsemen, adventurers, and it just got, you know, tens of thousands of shares and random people from all over the world pitched into it and um, that was really encouraging at the time to see like you know this mass support from all over the place fund the film and then whenever we released the film there was so much ownership from you know I think there was 1400 people that all pitched into that movie so you had 1400 just mega fans that were inviting all their friends to the theaters and you know they take they take ownership of it and it's still cool I, to this day i run into people all the time that were like hey you remember that unbranded kickstarter i you know i i, I put 40 dollars into that i'm like cool let me buy you a taco right now thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic it's, it's so nice because that of course is the the other part of distribution right when you get those people to invest in it they're invested not just monetarily but but you know they're they're part of that film and they want to then share it and that has a knock on effect that you don't probably quite realize when you're first getting into it. So are you still using that method to to raise funds? I know you're getting funds from other organizations. Or what have you? Do you still use Kickstarter with uh, say with Deep in the Heart that you you just have um, released? Uh, how did you raise the funds for that one? No, so deep in the heart, uh, so we I haven't done a Kickstarter campaign in many years. To be quite honest, it is extremely stressful. And um, I also just hate asking people for money. Uh, yeah. That's just, that's, that's very against, um, even if they want to fund your work, it's still such an awkward phone conversation to be like, hey, you know, Uncle Timmy, you got 50 bucks by <laughs> chance, uh, need some memory cards. Right. Um, so I, 
I haven't done a Kickstarter for any of my personal projects since Unbranded. Um, all of our short films are primarily either uh, a brand or a couple brands, or it's a um, research institute or an NGO that needs some help with communicating a message about something that they're trying to do, whether that's ocelot research or um, you know bringing back 2,000 acres of land, restoring it to its native habitat. Uh, we do a variety of different films for many organizations and you know it's 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 helpful to them because they can take that you know six minute film and show potential donors they can use it to like bring in potential you know new partners into their goal or their mission so we do that's primarily our our short films for our feature films what we did with both the river and the wall and with deep in the heart is we partnered with a fiscal sponsor where we were able to apply for grants through that fiscal sponsor, as well as um, have private individuals contribute through that fiscal sponsor. So those individuals were able to have a tax write-off and then the grants were, or the foundations, you know, gave that money to meet like a specific goal that they had. So, you know, for Deep in the Heart, for example, that is very much like a environmental education film. And uh, it also meets a variety of other things that check the boxes for these different grants and these different individuals. And because films are, you know, possibly, if not definitely, the most impactful experience that someone can have from a learning perspective, um, I do think that there's tremendous value in funding movies. And I think that some foundations and some individuals see that so we were able to fund uh both the river and the wall and the majority of deep in the heart through individuals and through those grants um which is amazing and it's you know a testament to the amount of philanthropic individuals and the value that these foundations put on education and i'm incredibly grateful to you know every person who's supported our work we could not do it without them because i can't figure out how to make a way to like make make a film profitable uh, which is very unfortunate I, I really wish that I could find a profitable business model but I haven't been able to do so yet yeah and that is always such a hard part of this is that um, you know your, your films all have a message I mean you're inspired by film to make a message come out and have impact within your films and that's very noticeable um, but, but one of the things that we as filmmakers who want to have an impact on the world lack is this way of how do we make it profitable because we're trying to always okay I need this for that I need this for that it's you have to be a business owner really without any business training and you know all your goals are is to make the film and get that message out and then of course when you do it and you, you realize wow I didn't quite put enough in there to pay all my bills or this you know this pro this issue happened that we didn't have contingency for um and it is so sad because it seems like i mean there's this almost stereotype that you know if you're making a film with a message it shouldn't make profit you know it should be like all the money goes to the cause and and it's such a shame because why why shouldn't filmmakers like yourself make a good profit from it that inspires you to keep going and and gives you you know uh, the the comfort and the the safety financially to be able to do that and yet you know many people i speak to who are in, in your sh same shoes as being a um a, a very message driven filmmaker are always kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel to trying to get projects made um and it is a sad thing hopefully there is a model out there that we can find and all utilize and i think now of course we are in this era of being able to fund ourselves and distribute ourselves then that is probably the closest model we're going to get you know to be able to do that we just have to change our mindset so that it's okay for us to take money from the project you know to fund ourselves but okay mo moving on um i mean you're you know your, your messages are fantastic i mean watching deep in the heart um watching you know unbranded uh the um uh, horse rich dirt poor the films that you you know at the end of the day you you have a message that you want to have real impact on the ground and many films 
you know, some of the largest landmark series in the world have great messages in them. But a lot of the time what happens is we're left feeling um, like these problems are just way too big for us to solve or have any actual, you know, any um, anything that we can actually do to have impact as individuals. And I think what I like about your films is it brings these messages far kind of closer to home. And with Deep in the Heart, and I don't want to give it all away here, but with Deep in the Heart, just I love the way at the end, and we should talk about some of the middle stuff as well, but here I am skipping to the end. I love the way that you just kind of circled back on the whole thing. And you showed something that's very close to my heart. I'm in uh, in Nevada. Nevada is growing immensely fast. It's one of the fastest growing states in the country um, because of big commercial um, uh, companies coming in here, Tesla and what have you. You know, it, it, the population growth is astronomical. And of course, what comes with that is loss of certain types of habitat. And um, and I do, you do a great job of stringing that all together at the end, and I, I felt that was really powerful. Um, what was your when, when you looked at making deep in the heart? What was your guiding principle? What was the message? I mean, obviously that was the message. Hey, there's growth. We have a lot of wildlife here. You wanted to inspire people with the wildlife in their state, but in terms of not just selling it to uh, a Texas audience, what was the kind of inspiration behind that? Um, well, Texas is my home. I grew up in Amarillo, went to high school in San Angelo, studied wildlife at A&M, and then have poked around all around West Texas and South Texas my, my whole life, pretty much. So, you know, I've had the very good fortune of knowing my subject matter well. And, uh, gosh, we were wrapping up the river and the wall four years ago and I just remember thinking to myself I want to do a blue chip because you know having characters that are humans is cool but not nearly as cool as wildlife and I also love spending weeks on end with the long lens or with camera traps and like just trying to get these behaviors that are so rarely seen on film so I wanted to do a blue chip and the obvious choice was to do it about a place that I knew which was Texas there was no way that I could fund a series there was no way that I could pitch a series because who am I I've never even done a blue chip anything before so it's not like anybody would take that seriously um, so I decided to make a feature length film about my home state that had uh, 12 different wildlife sequences that were going to be, you know, approximately seven minutes long that would symbolize, each of them would symbolize something greater than just a beautiful animal doing something cool. I wanted them to tell not only the story of that behavior, but the story about also our relationship with the natural world and how it's always changing, how it's always evolving, and how humans are capable of doing truly amazing things and then also doing truly terrible things, often not even knowing that you're doing it. So we put a whole bunch of different animals and behaviors onto a whiteboard, and we just started thinking about what are some of the biggest conservation issues in the state. And we came up with, um, you know, the the loss of water um you know we're, we're running out of water in texas and that guided us to tell the story of the guadalupe bass and the blind catfish and how the aquifers that the blind catfish live in feed the rivers that go into the guadalupe bass those rivers grow and then they flood and it creates the spawning habitat for the alligator gar as the rivers make its way out into the Gulf of Mexico, it provides for, you know, these dolphins. It also provides for these redfish that along with the nutrients from these rivers flow out into the Gulf of Mexico where they spawn and live out their adult lives. Go a little bit further and we've got these amazing coral reefs. So trying to find connectivity and hydrology was really important in identifying our characters. And then also um, 
and that was actually whenever we first storyboarded this movie out, we were going to follow it from the source populations of our springs out to sea because most of Texas river basins begin in the state and end in the state. So that was going to be our, our movie flow and our character of, of beginning to end. The problem that we had with that is the flow of water is a weak character and also some of the scenes that we had that were extremely emotional with that structure came too early in the film and we needed to move those scenes to the end of act two to where we like really hit people hard in particular the mountain lion scene where you feel like yeah. all hope is lost in the world sure. um so we ended up changing our primary character in the film from being water to being our society's relationship with the natural world with water as kind of a side character and with that new character and this happened about halfway through cinematography when i realized we had this problem and, and then i just rescripted the whole movie um but with that character of our society's relationship with the natural world we started that character with the bison slaughter at the very beginning the movie opens like a ken burns film like you get to yeah. see these images of what it used to look like you get to see this tragic loss of life and then how of the five million bison in Texas, only five of them survived this slaughter due to one of Texas's earliest conservationists, Molly Goodnight, who saved them. And then now the survivors of that herd are roaming across the prairies today. Beautiful story. Yeah. So that's how we started the film. And then, you know, and those throughout pictures, the film. I just want to say those pictures are so impactful. I mean, that, that mountain of buffalo skulls, which I've seen before in museums and what have you, but it's so, it doesn't matter how many times you see the image, you can't help but just to have your jaw drop and say, you know, what have we done? How, how do we get to that point? But yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, there's, there's more skulls in that picture than there is buffalo alive today. Right. Which is astonishing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Um, I, I want to say that that stack of skulls was like 800,000 or wow, or just, just an astronomical number. But And, and for listeners, so we, just I should say that obviously this is in the film and you can see the film and we'll talk about that later. But um, this is a picture of a, a, there's a guy actually standing or sitting on top of this pile of skulls, which is literally a mountain. I mean, that thing... Gosh, I mean, if that person's five and a half to six feet tall, that thing's got to be 25 feet tall or something, that mountain of skulls. It's insane. Yeah, it's, it's, it's truly gross. Um, but it's part of our history, and it needs to be acknowledged that, yeah. you know, there was yeah. this massive loss that happened, and, and some species have recovered. And that's what we showed in the film is, you know, the bison have recovered, desert sheep have recovered, white-tailed deer have recovered, and then there's other animals that that haven't that still need help and you know the example that we use for that is is the ocelot where we spent you know nine months uh camera trapping the the first ever footage of ocelots in the united states um wow i didn't realize that it was the first ever that's incredible yeah yeah that 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 i've ever seen or know about and i've spent a lot of time researching ocelots sure uh, yeah yeah, so that's that's kind of how we we picked out the stories. Is um, you know we had our big character of our society's relationship, which culminates at the end of this flashback through the ecosystems and these big theoretical questions of like, what are we going to do to ensure this biodiversity continues to exist with these big challenges that we have ahead of us? And then during the credit roll, you've got like twenty different organizations that do phenomenal things in Texas for people to join and see like, all right, I want to get yeah. involved in ocelots. I'm going to do Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. I want to get involved in education. I'm going to do Texan by nature and try to like put a spotlight on these organizations yeah. that are doing everything they can uh, to help out these species. Yeah, I love that. The fact that you've got all of those listed very prominently so people can find them and go straight to those links. 
uh, is is so good for those organizations who who normally get a little credit in there somewhere for helping out in a film or something like that but to really say hey these are these people and this is why you're watching this film this is these are the people you can be in contact with is is fantastic i want to go back to the ocelots very quickly because one of the things that as a filmmaker um you know one of the things i noticed was how you put a sequence together with a lot of different angles of camera traps so how many camera traps did you put out and and what kind of camera traps were you using because they're obviously very high quality they look amazing but you were able to build a sequence in in multiple different ways which was incredible that was all done on a green screen (laughs) <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> um, so the, in your studio, <laughs> yeah. God, I hope that never happens. I hope that day never right. comes in wildlife filmmaking. Well, well uh, um, yeah. So the ocelot sequence. Whenever we went into it, uh, we were planning on it being similar to the our planet sequence of the Siberian tiger where you ha- you just have this powerful music and then there's like 10 shots of this yeah. magnificent animal roaming through the brush. So that's what we thought we would be able to get with ocelots is just a handful of shots, really just traveling shots and no behavior at all. Um, but we had this incredibly good fortune to meet with some wildlife biologists at the East Foundation in the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. And they had this cat that we began calling Mama Jane. And Mama Jane was 11 years old when we first started following her. And she was collared previously in her life. So they had a very good, they had very good information of like, not only what her home range is, which is very small for an ocelot or for a cat species, their home ranges sometimes can be as small as like 150 acres. Uh, but we also knew like hot spots where she really uh, liked to hang out, like down to, you know, a, a 10 meter area. So we went into that location and we put up these like just um, consumer grade model camera traps. Uh, we were using some reconics and some Brownings. We put about 40 of them out into the brush, just all the trails, all the spots where there was little hot spots on the gps collar data and figured out not only like where she traveled but also like which trail she traveled down and then we uh worked with a company in the uk called t shed there is this camera nerd named nick turner there who makes these uh, camera traps that um are they live inside of a pelican case and then there's the little ammo can below them that has the battery and the inside the pelican case there's this little computer that has a transmitter and then you set out these beam beam brake triggers made by cognosis out to where the animal is going to be walking through the animal walks through the beam brake it sends a signal to the pelican case uh, into the computer inside the pelican case and tells the camera to turn on seven seconds after the animal walked through that beam break. So you've got to like <laughs> right. position it down the trail a yeah. little ways. Um, very, very full of frustrations. Uh, sure, camera absolutely. Trapping. Yeah. But, um, but we were able to, to get some awesome footage. We used the Panasonic GH five S camera for that. Cause they've got that dual sensor, um, with, with pretty good low light capabilities and, And yeah, we had six uh, camera traps for that particular sequence. And what we would do is uh, most of the time have two sets of three and just have a wide, a medium and a tight and, um, you know, set it up on the trail that we thought that they were going to go down or the log that we thought that they were going to sniff or the bush that we found that they like to lay down underneath and uh, set them up and uh took a uh, nine months of of camera trapping to get that sequence and with that amount of time we were able to just get some true gems of behavior um the hunting sequence uh the mom searching for her kitten like yeah. really really emotional stuff that that connects you to those cats and i think we ended up with like 
nine and a half hours of daytime ocelot footage and wow. we were going into it thinking we may end up getting five shots so uh, oh, wow. it was yeah. an amazing experience and we're actually coming out with a film uh on pbs this fall just on ocelots like a full 50 minutes so that'll be out later this year well, I, I, yeah, I was thinking that you may end up doing more with that because once people see though that footage, and as you say, it's not been filmed before, uh, I think you'll have a lot of a lot of people contacting you to try and be filming those again for other programs. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a can very I emotional. Talk, sure. Should I talk a little bit about how cool our thoughts are? Yeah, of course. All right, so so yeah. for you for those of you guys in the United States, like the ocelot. So historically, they were like southern Oklahoma, a little bit into Arkansas, western uh, Louisiana, you know, forests of East Texas, all of our thick river bottoms. They covered a substantial amount of country in our state. They were in southern Arizona some too. And then, you know, early 1900s, there was massive logging. 1930s, there was this big poison program to get rid of the coyotes, trapping, hunting, etc. The ocelots were bycatch to a lot of those anti-predator efforts and they were completely extirpated with the exception of two small populations in deep south texas one of them's on public land at the laguna at Tescosa national wildlife refuge the other one's on private land uh, there's less than 80 cats that we know of uh, they are highly susceptible to disease to a massive hurricane to a fire and we should be doing a lot more for ocelots. Thankfully, since a lot of that habitat destruction has occurred, thankfully because we no longer have massive poison programs to get rid of all of our predators, there's been a lot of other areas that are inside of the historic ocelots range that that habitat has regrown. Those discriminatory practices are no longer practicing or are no longer happening. So there's a lot of potential historic habitat that could be used for reintroductions. And in Northern Mexico, there is a very healthy ocelot population. And what I would love to see in my lifetime is to have a very ambitious ocelot recovery plan happen of taking animals outside of Northern Mexico, translocating them into the historic population. And I think that it's just a beloved animal that, you know, eats mice, it's not controversial. So we should totally bring back more ocelots. Right. Yeah. Okay, moving on. No, I, well, that's great. <laughs> I, I love it. A plug for ocelots. <laughs> that's fantastic. I love them. And of course, yeah. you know, talking about bycatch and, and uh, the, the scene with the mountain lion and the, and the, um, the traps, I'm assuming, you know, one of the issues, I mean, we have a huge, the same thing here in Nevada, you know, trapping is just massive, mainly for bobcat and mountain lion. I'm assuming you know something to some degree has to change for ocelots to be able to thrive in those areas if there's still all this trapping going on because you know putting ocelots out onto the into new areas where trapping occurs isn't that just going to create you know more and more ocelots being being trapped as bycatch from uh, uh you know trappers trying to get bobcats etc no, I, th I don't think so. I mean, obviously there's areas that wouldn't make sense for ocelot reintroductions, but the beautiful thing about ocelots is their home range sizes are so small. Like if you have a 30,000 acre good habitat area that doesn't, you know, that is fairly secure, that is heavily forested, that is in historic ocelot habitat, like there's a good chance that that population will take if, if you give it a chance. Um, and, you know, because Texas is a private land state, because we have like little pockets of public land, you could put together an area like that that is suitable, much different than a mountain lion where, you know, you've got potentially 100 square miles of, of territory that one individual will roam. So the challenges of restoring ocelots are much more accomplishable than than many species. Sure. And, and actually that, you know, the fact that um, it, that Texas is mainly private land, of course, makes it much easier because then they have some control over who's actually trapping on their land. Here, of course, in Nevada, I, I think it's changed now. It's somewhere, it's near 90% of the land in uh, Nevada is public lands. So, of course, trappers can trap over almost 90% of the wild lands here. So there's a lot of indiscriminate trapping that goes on, um, but makes... 
you know, makes it very hard for the animals that are getting trapped in there who, who well, for any animal that's being trapped in there, let's face it. But I recently got introduced to Athletic Greens as a way to optimize for better gut health, get more energy, and optimize the immune system. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. It's a lifestyle-friendly brand, which means whether you're eating keto or paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it's going to work for you. It contains less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. And for every purchase, Athletic Greens is going to donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the U.S. In fact, in 2020 alone, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. And not only that, Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company. Again, in 2020, Athletic Greens purchased carbon credits to support projects protecting old growth rainforests. That's huge. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with the convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. So to make it easy... Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do to get this deal is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging. That's E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to the show. Before we leave the cats behind, uh, mountain lions, you had some amazing shots in there, some real close up. Uh, the camera trap shots, you could tell, you know, they're coming down and a beautiful one of the cat coming down and drinking at the spring there. At the end, you had some very close ups of the face of a mountain lion, almost looked like those were shot with a handheld camera or, you know, from a long lens. Uh, were those or were they all uh, camera traps? Uh, the mountain lion sequence that we had took 14 months to get, and we used every single clip that we shot. That's how wow. hard it was to put together that sequence. Yeah. Um, one of the shots was a long lens where I was just driving down the road in Big Bend one day, and a mountain lion crossed the road in front of me, and I just happened to have a, a nice. completely built-out red sitting in my lap. And I was like, oh, I'll nail this shot here. <laughs> um, but everything else was, was camera traps. and. But yeah, I mean, that's that's the beauty of camera traps is you can have like a 30 millimeter objective and set your focal length at 12 inches away and get shots like that that just feel so intimate and so close to the animal. You feel like you're really in their space in yeah. a way that you could never get with a long lens. Yeah, and that's a testament to your camera trap and your team's camera trapping skills because knowing where to put those and get those kind of shots is key, of course. Um, yeah. Okay. No, moving it's, on. It's worth saying, like, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Carry on. Uh, I was going to say it's worth saying. Literally every single sequence that we had in Deep in the Heart, we not only had you know phenomenal shooters shooting it that work at Fin and Fur, but we also have uh, we also had different scientists, different researchers, different um, you know landowners, ranchers, just just different folks helping us out. And I think that in this industry there's often uh you know a focus on 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 the shooter but anybody who's shooting anything was taken there by somebody else so hats off to all the guides and all the researchers and and the different institutes that help us out because no wildlife sequence is, is possible without them certainly not for anything i've ever done 
Yeah, no, I would 100% agree. Now, I mean, part of research for any film is is finding the people who have the intimate contact with the species that you're looking for, whether it's a researcher, um, you know, a guide. And so, no, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, when we're out there with our long lenses, we're there because someone has told us where to go or we've had, um, you know, an intimate relationship ourselves with that particular species. And, and that's something that we have some expertise in um but there's a lot of people behind the scenes for sure so so you did you f actually film some of the footage in there because i know you're not credited i don't think as a cinematographer on it you're you're writer director um what other roles did you play throughout the whole of uh deep in heart uh i shot probably 20 percent of that movie so I, I shot quite a bit of it um and then you know wear many hats i spent many nights in the edit room and uh a lot of miles on the highway going to meet with people trying to get the funding together uh it was very much a, a small team passion project that took a lot out of took a lot out of my life and uh yeah i'm, I'm proud to sell that movie man it's it, it's it, it was literally three years of of our lives and you know fundraising was horrible during the pandemic you know we had many times yeah. where we thought that it it wouldn't come to fruition um and looking back on it you know we had incredibly good luck to get pretty much every sequence worked out as planned or better than planned and that is a rarity and there was certainly a, a lot of luck on our side and i feel like almost that the animals almost wanted their stories to be told at times um but yeah. it was it was cool i know a lot more now looking into my next films than i did that one well, you know, I think it's it's a, an incredible independent film because it, the the quality, the sequences, you know, these are you're getting sequences, and I love the way you said it. Almost felt like animals wanted their story to be told because I have I've had that kind of feeling being out in the field filming before. Like, you know, I, I, how have I been so lucky to get what I've got on camera? And sometimes it's just like the stars align. But and I, I think for you on and i don't know the budget but i i'm guarantee it's probably not a 15 million dollar budget like planet earth right 1.1 1.1 1, 1. 1. 1. 1. okay 1.1 1. 1. 1 million for what we made and, and it and a, distributed it for which is incredible and, and of in course we should <laughs> we're right. getting out of the red <laughs> right and we shouldn't of course overlook the fact you have matthew mcconaughey doing the narration for it um, you know, which is which is huge, and I know he's a, a, a huge uh, Texas advocate and lives in Texas, and um, you know, a great uh, match for doing the narration there. Um, you know, tell us so so. Um, uh, where was I going with that? I, I got off uh, I got off track, but you know, you've got so many species. It was a huge thing to take on to to be able to get sequences with all the diverse species you have, from sheep to lions to bats to fish you know you name it there's so much in there to show the diversity of it um it was huge to take on and what you've done is something that really really works so well and is very high quality so i take my hat off to you for that um it, speak to us very quickly about matthew mcconaughey you you obviously he he was obviously inspired by the film it's his home state what was the process like to try and get an a-list celebrity like matthew to do the narration for it I Googled who his agent was, and then I called him on the phone and was like, hey, I'd like for Matthew to narrate my movie. And uh, he said, send over a rough cut, send him a rough cut. Two days later, he called me back and was like, McConaughey loves it. What What are your terms? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So I had to just kind of like make up some terms on the fly. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> September 18th, let's do that day. <laughs> um, Excellent. It, it actually... It was remarkably easy getting him on, and I thought he just gave a phenomenal performance uh, yeah. with the narration. Super wonderful person to work with, and you know he really loves Texas. He cares about Texas. He's an outdoorsman. He loves to play outside. You know, so it was it was a great fit, and uh, I thought he just really took the film to the next level and gave a very beautiful poetic narration and you forget that it's matthew mcconaughey talking to you uh as you watch the movie uh, but a lot of the narration too you know we we spent a lot of time 
on the delivery and you know we had a lot of words that had some emotion into it as well and and he was able to to really bring out that that narration emotion and that's something that that i think um is often lacking in some yeah. natural history films is you know you bring in this a-list celeb they've got four hours to record they read through the whole thing but especially if they haven't watched it beforehand uh or if you're not able to like kind of tweak the cut afterwards around their their narration sometimes it doesn't land on the beats sometimes it doesn't quite have the right inflection um, and, you know, fortunately, we, we practiced enough to where whenever we did have Matthew, uh, we were able to get, you know, just this, this beautiful performance out of him. And he was just great to work with. Yeah, I think the advantage of having a, an actor of that caliber, they know how to, you know, produce that emotion in their words. And as you say, poetically, and he has one of those voices that is very good at, at doing that. He, he's able to draw you in and um, and utilize the tone of his voice to, to bring you into that story. And he did that very it, well. And you can tell he had a passion it, for it. It was tough, though. Like something that nobody talks about in this industry is that dance at the end of the edit yeah. where you have to get, you know, the, the, the visual cuts to flow with the musical cuts to flow with the narration and make it into a music video. I mean, that's what, that's what it is. And then, you know, bring in the sound design and you got all these different components and, uh, it took us, you know, one of the things, and, it, and it's probably my inexperience as a director, but I provided the, the narration for the temp narration and kind of assumed that all narration would fit into the same time gaps. So I made the mistake of, of uh, using my temp narration, then getting it composed and then going to Matthew. And then Matthew delivered his performance, which was beautiful. And then we plugged it into the film and we realized like, oh man, he says words that take, or he, he'll deliver a line that only takes up like 80% of the amount of time that it took for me to deliver that line. And also we can't just chop up his words the way that you can chop up my words because he delivers these lines where they, they kind of flow almost like a, like a song. It's like a trance whenever he talks and you can't break those sentences apart. So it took us, you know, a couple of weeks of just, finessing those lines and finessing the cue and finessing the the picture to get it to really flow in a way that you just kind of get lost into the movie and just get captured by the story and don't have those interruptions i mean that's that's one of the things that we say is if you notice the cinematography or if you noticed the editing then we have failed as a storyteller Right. Yeah. And, and you're right. We don't speak much about that. So I'll have an editor on here at some point and we'll talk more about those things. But you're right. It's, it's, it's so hard to get that flow right. And, in, you, and, and that's the thing. When you see a really good film and it flows so well, you don't think about it. Right. You don't think it's only when things don't flow very well that you, you notice it. And yet to get it to flow so well emotionally, the, the, the story arcs, the, the use of music to heighten that emotion, the narration to fit in time, to fit the energy of it. All of those things are so unbelievably hard on their own to achieve. And then, as you say, it's almost like a dance. You're trying to get all of those things together to fit, uh, and it's extremely hard. Um, you did a great job. It's wonderful. His narration's fantastic. It fits it so well. And, um, you, you know, just well, thank you. You, you really, what, what's so nice is that not only did you do a, a program which is like a landmark blue chip series, or, or you know, in, in terms of a one and a half hour program, but you also, it all ties together, which in so many of these other series, it's more like, here's this species, here's this species. You know, they're not as tied together as they are in your film. So you really took it to another level by connecting them all by their state and obviously just by, you know, the issues that they face. And that's a fantastic job. I, I take my hat off again to you. Um, I, I want to go to my favorite species and sequence in the whole thing and um I, I have a reason why it's my favorite How, can you guess any guesses bracken cave yes bracken cave how did you do <laughs> <laughs> bracken cave you know i have to say that is 
the best Bracken Cave footage I've ever seen. Um, Thank in you. terms of using slow mo footage on those bats, it, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. And I'm assuming that's a, a Phantom Flex or, or something similar to get that slow mo footage. Yeah, we used the Flex for a few days to get that. Yeah, I mean, it's phenomenal. Those that it that is a species and an event that lends itself so beautifully to that being done. And I don't know whether you know, I, I filmed in Bracken Cave back in 2005 or 2006. And I got to go into the cave. I, I filmed in the mouth as they were coming out. And I got to go way down into the bottom of the cave and almost passed out because we didn't have respirators with us. So, you oh, know, we spent some time <laughs> down in there because of the ammonia in there. Um, but we, you know, we spent uh, about uh i can't remember how many days there uh filming a, an episode for a series we did called wild events um let's say about 15 15 odd years ago and you know I, I mean i the experience of that was incredible seeing you know millions of bats coming out and coming back in every day is astonishing in itself filming it in a way where you know we didn't use any snow mode nothing over 60 frames per second because we're going back to you know we were using a sony f900 which were you know just limited to a degree back then for what they could do um and so seeing that sequence that you did that made my heart sing just because i'm like that's what i wish we could have done you know 17 odd years ago i wish we could have done that the other thing you did um was that we, we filmed some of the snakes coming down and we had heard that uh, snakes would actually hang off of that cave and, you know, try and capture them and what have you. And we didn't manage to film that due to time. But the fact that you had a sequence in there with the snakes coming in and actually eating the bats, I was like, yes, he did it. You know, which again was great because that's something I would have loved to have done. And we just didn't have the time. And, uh, you know, we had one camera and uh, it was a presenter led show. So it was all about me presenting this event um and, and yeah it, there, there were so many things we came away going god this could, could have been so much better and you did all those things and it's wonderful it really is good well thanks i'll pass that along to our team uh, we uh we edited that that sequence that was probably the most heavy editing that we did in the sense that it was it was so hard to figure out what is the best story of just this amazing visual treat and like when do you um you know, introduce the characters of the snake and the hawk and the peregrine falcon and, you know, these baby bats that are trying to escape for the first time they ever fly, not run into another of the 10 million bats emerging from the cave or the cave wall or get eaten by the snakes and then actually exit, not get eaten by the hawk and then like fly out and then catch insects using echolocation. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable what these bats at Bracken yeah. Cave do. Um, and we wanted to 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 edit it in a way that like did have the excitement of the emergence and like the peril of the snakes and as we were cutting it we we were having a lot of trouble it's almost like whenever you watch a war movie and there's just like 10 minutes of gore and right by the end of it you know, you got people getting stabbed by swords and you don't even care because you've already seen that for like the past seven sure. minutes. You yeah, have to know when people are going to get stabbed and then like reset people's emotions. Um, so we were struggling with that scene because like it was so much death and destruction of these bats that it lost its its momentum. So we dialed it way back and we uh, we cut it to where it was the journey of of, of this one bat as it watches all of its friends get slowly picked off and you're like rooting for him and rooting for him. Yeah. And then our, our editor, Sam, um, did a brilliant job. He watched a bunch of horror films for inspiration on Bracken cave, not because bats are scary, but to figure out timing on like jump scares for the yeah. viewer and like, how do you, set up what they think is going to happen and then have something come in that they have no idea and their character just got picked off and we watched uh the texas chainsaw massacre for inspiration like <laughs> whenever all those kids are walking up to the house you don't know that Leatherface is in there and neither do they and then all of a sudden the character is just grabbed and shoved on a meat hook 
And that's what we did with our bat. Like, you're like, oh man, the poor guy got stuck in a cactus. Oh my God, there's a snake. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and, and that and was fantastic. The fact, from there. <laughs> right. And the fact you, you had shots of that happening all at once. I mean, the, the snake coming in behind the bat was fantastic I love because it. <laughs> all all i had in my mind was man i hope they show the snakes like the snakes are just this i mean they're there e that ecosystem is incredible those snakes just hang there the whole time it's why why wouldn't you right and yeah, it's, it's so and it's cool. just such a yeah it really is and then when the bat is stuck on that piece of cactus and the snake comes in the background. I'm like, wow, you guys nailed it. You nailed that shot says everything, right? Sh shout out I, to I, the I, cinematographer, uh, Ryan Olinger for that one. He, he sat right. at the bottom of a bat cave. He sat at the bottom of Bracken for like, I think like 14 days straight, just getting peed on by millions of bats every night yeah. and inhaling their ammonia and, uh, waiting for the perfect strike. And he got it. Uh, it was, it yeah. was Ryan, Austin Alvarado and uh, our DP Skip Hobby that that shot the majority of that scene and they just did a phenomenal job. Yeah, fantastic. I, I loved it. And then of course I didn't mention the birds which you brought in the peregrine falcon and the red tails and what have you. You know, again to get shots of them actually picking bats out of the air. You know, just just really cool. I mean, it really shows that you know. I mean, it's the numbers obviously. No, safety in numbers. There's millions of them. So. So it's, you know, the odd one being picked off, but just to have that footage and show it was just, uh, it was fantastic. You know, it made, it made me really happy to see that because I've not seen it done so well. So again, nicely done, nicely done. So, um, you know, again, let's, um, let, let's talk about where people can see the film because I think that's really important. It's available all over the place. I know it's, is it still doing the rounds in Texas theaters or was that through June? So our distribution, um, I'm, I'm a big theater person. I think that, you know, I equate it to, to church. You know, where else do you go when you turn off your phone and you're, you're not supposed to talk to the person next to you? And, you know, you pay attention for, you know, 60, 70 minutes with full attention. Like um, a theatrical experience, I think, is one of the most profound experiences that a person can have and for me i really pushed heavy for theaters on this and we were very fortunate to meet uh, a fellow by the name of michael tuckman who has m tuckman uh media which is a theatrical booking company and uh michael came on board our team and he reached out to AMC and Regal and Alamo Draft House and all the different chains told them about the film and really, you know, sold them on this idea that a, that a nature film could do well, uh, which is, you know, not, um, not usual. Like nature films don't sure. have theatrical runs. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the theater business, but what most theaters require is a six week theatrical only window uh, as a minimum. So we did a, a six week theatrical window uh, or 45 days is, is what the window is. So we did a 45 day theatrical window and then the theaters that come on board on week one, if it performs up to standard, then it will show on week two. So they book it by the week, uh, either one showing or two showings in the different screens. Uh, so we opened up in 70 theaters across Texas and it, did really well. People loved the movie and uh, we ended up booking it through that entire six week period. Uh, to, it was so successful. We had uh, around 50,000 people that came in and, wow. and watched it on the big screen, which is just uh, it tripled our expectations and, yeah. you know, made me realize that there is a legitimate market um, for, you know, wildlife, natural history on the big screen. Uh, I think it helps that, you know, our target audience is, is Texas based. It was a Texas film and, you know, Texans really love Texas. But I think that that type of theatrical model could be done elsewhere, you know, like on uh, Wild California or yeah, know, Montana or wherever. Like people love their home and they yeah. want to see something on the big screen. And it's one thing to watch a natural history film on your laptop it's a whole other thing whenever 
there's a 60 foot mountain lion that's bigger than an 18 wheeler that steps out and like comes and sniffs your face in a theater in <laughs> surround sound so You're right we put a lot of effort you just need you need one of those theaters that have the sprays as well so when it snorts it you know the, the water <laughs> hits you in the face <laughs> yeah the, the, snake the lion the spit. rumbles <laughs> <laughs> that's right there you go mm-hmm. do, it, it, with that experience of putting it on theaters do, do you end up in the red from that or do you actually make anything back from putting it out having no we got in, we got into it, the black it, on our theaters um uh, i think we spent about twenty five thousand on our theatrical booker uh, we spent 20 on a publicist and 50 on uh, advertising. And then um, the uh, we box office right at 500,000. The theater takes um, 60 to 65% of that. So we ended up uh, we ended up making money off of it. Not not more Excellent. than I think we probably ended up with like 60 or $70,000 once once everything finally settles and we're we're still kind of going through this, but so it wasn't like, you know, an astronomical amount of money, but you know, sure. from an education perspective and from an impact perspective to provide that experience for that many yep. people you know, it was it was totally worth it and uh honestly looking back I I kind of wished we had gone bigger, but you know, it was ambitious at the time, but I think next time I'll sure. I'll probably even be more ambitious cuz now I know the demand is there. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the thing. I mean, it's such a good outlet for people in the home state to get that amount of people just put their eyes on it and get excited about it, but then to make money off the top of it is it's fantastic in such a short period of time. So, um Yeah, I mean, the theatrical so release is out. a risk though because you get to put all your yeah. money into that opening day and then like if it doesn't perform well enough for the theater to book it for the next week, then you know you're that's it. You're going to be out of a lot of cash. Uh, you know, yeah, tens of thousands, uh, if not hundreds of thousands. And like for a for a national release, it would be uh, an amount of money that would be incredibly intimidating and, and and risky. I think, but you know, because I know Texas so well, because we have a built in audience in Texas, because we had so many partners that that helped us on this. You know, we felt pretty good going into it. And then also, you know, like our our mission with the film because it was you know funded from philanthropy from private dollars like turning a profit is is great that that helps us stay like you know business feasible and moving forward but we can look at things and say like all right that's going to be risky uh but if it's going to have a large education impact then you know we should do that because that's that's the goal of the film so where ben where can people see it now if they want to if they hear this um and they want to go and see the film tell me tell us where they can go right now to click on it and pay a rental fee and and watch the movie yep so we did a 45 day theatrical run and then we released um on transactional video on demand platforms we used a company called bitmax based out of la they're an aggregator and they take your product and then they put it onto uh, these different platforms. So we put ours on uh, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, and Google Play. Uh, so you can go there. I think it's twelve ninety nine to buy it, and then four ninety nine to rent it. Uh, Apple TV, it's a seventy thirty split for the first six months, and then Prime and Google Play, it's a fifty fifty split, um, and then you know you can kind of see where that revenue streams come from um and then you know just get it out there as as far as you can with social media and with with pull all the strings you have to let people know about the movie and then um give it your best shot on as much publicity as you can and try to embargo the press where it all comes out on the vod and see what happens and that's kind of kind of where we're at right now um i think we're gonna have a distribution partner for broadcast later this fall and then working with a lot of like the the SVOD companies um, that, you know, do educational stuff as well. Um, and then we had the good fortune to have a curriculum writer, wonderful person named Anne-Marie Fay, and she wrote curriculum on the different sequences in the film. So we've, you know, made these little seven to 10 minute short films, separated them out, uh, put them for free on YouTube, and which has like a curriculum guide for, you know, s- teachers to teach kids about how cool uh, that's wonderful. Bracken Cave is. And, yeah. Uh, water and that kind of thing that's great that's really great 
Ben, la- last of all, what it, in terms of independent filmmaking, right? You're a, you're an established, successful independent filmmaker. What would you say to people who, <clears throat> I mean, there's there's lots of different avenues here. There are independent filmmakers out there who want to work with networks and get their stuff on broadcast TV. Independent filmmakers who are looking just to stay independent, uh, but stay viable by actually getting money in and being profitable so they can earn some money. What advice would you give them to, uh, you know, to help them stay on their course? Pay yourself. Because if you don't pay yourself, you can't keep making a film. Like if you if you go into a three year project and you don't pay yourself, then you're not going to be able to make your ends meet. And if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the rest of your team, uh, and you can't you can't finish the product, and you certainly can't continue to do it over time. Um, that's something that I've had personal issues with of just putting the priority of, of the film over, over myself. And I've, I've gotten myself into a bind and I've, I've been fortunate to like, you know, see the other side of that, but you've, you've got to put yourself in, into the budget and, and you have to, you have to take care of yourself and, you know, um, you can't count on the movie to turn out in, in the black. Uh, even if your movie is a smash hit, you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to get picked up for a three figure. You know, there's no guarantee Hulu is going to pick it up for 250. Certainly no guarantee that Netflix is going to pick it up for a mill. Definitely no guarantee that it's going to take off like you thought it would on VOD sales. Even if it does take off on VOD sales and make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, is that going to be enough to cover your cost? And that's something that I think, um, I struggle with and a lot of other really ambitious filmmakers struggle with is they are willing to set aside their own personal safety to to finish a film and you may be able to do it once you may be able to do it twice but you can't make like a a career out of out of not taking care of yourself and I think that also leads to a lot of burnout with a lot of really good filmmakers where they'll make phenomenal films and they'll get to the end of it and they're freaking broke. And then they have to do something that they don't want to do, like take commercial work or, you know, make real estate videos or do that kind of stuff. And uh, it's hard. I mean, I live in a state that has a lot of money and there's a lot of foundations that give money to wildlife, that give money to the arts and I don't know if I would be able to do what I'm doing right now in another place simply because I don't have that that donor base. And I really wish, you know, that wasn't the case of, you know, having to rely on foundations and and individuals to to fund our our films and our art. But, you know, even with, you know, putting these 50,000 people in theaters and having it take off and be number two on Apple TV. Like I still can't get enough revenue out of a, out of a film to pay for all of the production. And that is extremely unfortunate uh, because it makes everything extremely more, much more difficult. Um, And at the same time, I have had zero success getting something pitched successfully and paid for by some of the big networks um and hopefully one day that will change but thus far i haven't had had luck getting a big network to 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 fund the movie up front where i didn't have you know financial stress from from beginning to end uh, but yeah that's that's something i i think is you know don't don't spend money that you don't have and if you can't take care of yourself you can't take care of the rest of your team i think that's great advice you know we've not heard that before on here and i think it's so important because That is um, something we all do because we're all so passionate as filmmakers wanting to get our films made, get our message out there. 
we're the last people to get paid most of the time you know you are you bring in contractors you bring in crew you bring in you know services and of course they all have a price tag attached that you can then say okay allocate that here allocate that there and you forget sometimes or you think well, I'm pushing it too high by putting in a, a day rate for yourself. And, you know, when you're researching and you're sat at home online, you think, you know, can I pay myself for this? And it's of course you can. You know, I mean, that is that's how this thing is being made. And so I think that is so important. And you're right. If you don't pay yourself, no one else is going to do it and you're not going to be able to survive. So great great advice uh really appreciate that and um ben you know i think after this film you know the success of it and what have you i think you're gonna things will change and you'll be making broadcast tv for some big networks because it's a wonderful film it, i mean all of your films are wonderful the quality is there the message is there um you know with this having the uh the distribution that it's had and just you know the the way the story flows which is obviously the most important thing is um is fantastic so i wish you all the success in the future and can't wait to see what you do next well i i appreciate it i that that means a lot to me and i'll, I'll pass that word on to my team i will have to say you know i'm sure there's a lot of really good filmmakers out there but i i truly believe that the fin and fur films team that we have our editors our shooters like Golly, I have been so fortunate to have gotten to surround myself with the amount of talent and love and passion uh, that that everybody brings to the table on all of our projects. And you know, you can you can see it in the work. It's it's not a job for us. It's 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 it's, it's a meaning. And uh, we're growing our team right now. We've got two features in development. We've got more short films than we can handle. So if anybody out there is listening to this and you want a kick-ass job, please send me your resume. We're looking to grow our, our, our team right now. That's fantastic. Are you going to get a lot of people? I think you're going to get a lot Come of people on. emailing you. <laughs> How do they get in contact with you? I've got social media. Uh, our website, finninforfilms.com, has you know all of all the films that we have. Uh, it's got our producer, Katie Baldock's uh, email on there. E e easy to get a hold of me yeah just google me and um you'll Fantastic. you'll see me wonderful ben thank you so much for being on the master wildlife filmmaking podcast really appreciate it and uh, look forward to your work in the future it's an honor to be here i think that you're doing phenomenal work too by the way uh, i've listened to all of your episodes and it's just wonderful to hear all these different perspectives and to hear all these different experiences. And I think you're doing really great things for, for the industry and, and helping people out. So um, thank you for having me. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, I hope that's the case. Very much appreciated. Take care, Ben. See you later. Adios. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please consider leaving a rating and a comment. And subscribe if you haven't already done so from wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. The ratings really help rank the podcast and get more people to find it. Also, if you know someone who is into wildlife filmmaking, or maybe they're a nature photographer and they're looking to transition and they aren't listening to the podcast currently, please tell them about it. Word of mouth is the best way for me to build my listeners uh, for this podcast. I would very much appreciate it. And also, if you are looking to break into the wildlife filmmaking industry and you're just looking for help, you're looking for answers for burning questions that you have, then please consider looking at my Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring uh, Group and Mentorship Program. You can find that at Jake Willers dot com and just click on the mentoring tab or learn more tab where it says it on just the home page there you can find it very very easily and then lastly if you want to help support this podcast the best way you can do it other than just telling other people about the podcast is to go to our patreon page it's patreon.com forward slash mwfp 
That's patreon.com M forward slash MWFP. And there you can get all sorts of bonus content. We have extracts from podcasts that didn't make it to the, these episodes because they went on so long uh, because I didn't want to stop talking with our guests. So we put the extra content there. There are catch up conversations with previous guests, finding out what they've been doing since I last spoke to them and so much more of the behind the scenes. Please consider taking a look. That is the best way to sponsor this podcast and get more episodes in the future. 